Hey guys, what's up? So I got a good question here, I think, and um, it's from Dan, and he says, any tips or thoughts on what to expect for from a first job for any of us who get a shot at actual program programming job? He said, I've been approached by someone who might be a job lead. They're looking for a C sharp and uh, SQL experience, and ma mainly he looks like he's going to be uh, assigned to finding bugs or whatever. So. Um, my first question in response to that would be like, what type of company are we talking about? Is this going to be like a large company or is it going to be a much smaller company? Uh, personally, I've never worked in a startup environment, but I've actually created what I consider to be my own startup so that, you know, the code that is going in is very, uh, like, very fringe or balls to the wall. Like you're just releasing new code all the time. Um, you don't have a bunch of requirements that major companies have to deal with, like all these different rules and regulations, so you don't screw something up. Um, because there's not <clears throat> there's not as much money on the line. So, um, with your question though, like I would say, like if it's a large company, the the number one thing that you're going to experience, which I think uh, was a big shock to me, because I came from Python and into like a big C sharp corporate type of thing, and uh, code repositories were a big confusing thing for me. So you're going to deal with like you have all these different branches uh, of of code, and like you need to be working out of the right branch. And sometimes it's not it's not clear. Like, oh, we're releasing this code on this month or this day, and this is the branch that we should be working in. Oh, and I'm working out of the wrong branch, and you're like, oh, damn it. Um, another big thing with repositories, especially if you're using something like TFS, I feel like it doesn't handle the conflicts as well as like a Git. Um, and I'm not a Git expert. In fact, I know TFS much better than I know Git. Uh, but from the little bit I've seen, when it, when you deal with conflicts and, and merging branches and things like that, it seems to be much easier in Git than it does in TFS. In TFS, like I run into all these different, um, you know, these conflicts where like you're trying to check in a bunch of code, and um, you wrote the code yesterday. You waited like a day for a senior developer or like a group of people to review the code and say, okay, go ahead and, and check this in. And then you go to check it in. Um, and you got all these conflicts, so you grab the latest from the repository, you realize people are changing the files that you're working on, and then you have to go through line by line and deal with all that stuff. So those, um, you know, these merging conflicts are a very big headache in, in a large development environment when you have hundreds of developers. You're going to have these conflicts where you do not want to overwrite, overwrite what they were working on, um, but you need to be able to take what they were working on and your file and be able to merge both, uh, both of it in, and you want to make sure it then compiles and and that you're not going to run into any unexpected errors because sometimes the changes that they made break the stuff that you had that was getting ready to go in. So um, dealing with that is something that it will get easier with experience, but it's it's something that I think literally takes years in order to be able to perfect. Um, basically, to not freak out when you have to deal with you know these headaches. Um, the more the more senior you are, the more you just kind of go with it. You're like you know this is you know, typical bullshit that I deal with as a developer and you just get it done. But um, that is definitely a big culture shock. Another big culture shock to a larger company is that if they're a big C-sharp or Java uh, shop, then some of their code might be outsourced. So you're going to have code that's written by people uh, from overseas. And sometimes, you know, English isn't their primary language and sometimes they barely speak English at all. So not only do you have a, um, you know, a challenge when it comes to like, you know, uh, communicating there's also cultural differences so there's cultural differences between you know people based on their religions where they come from all these different things and for the most part you know companies are very agnostic uh, and don't uh, you know obviously take any sort of political preference or um, you know religious pre pre you know preference it's not like they're like hey you got to be a Christian or you're not working here nobody does that but what I'm saying is that people's backgrounds it's more than just like linguistically communicating with people that that can be a challenge it can also just be a cultural challenge like the things that you're talking about and that, that you might be interested in they have no idea like they don't play games in their company like they, they don't they don't play a playstation 4 or xbox one or they don't know american football uh or maybe they're big in soccer or cricket or like whatever like but in like india for instance they're big in the cricket but i have no idea what cricket is i think of cricket as a bug that jumps around and is nasty and you feed them to like lizards and stuff like that that's the cricket and to an american boy who grew up in america uh, I, I don't know the first thing about cricket. I I should probably look that up now that I'm talking about it. But I never, I'm just kind of coming off the cuff here that uh, that I even <laughs> mentioned this because typically if I don't know something and I have any, even the remote uh, slightest bit of interest, I'll look it up. Um, but anyway, so that that is interesting. And by the way, from a simple fact uh, that I well not really a fact, but a little tidbit that I looked up the other day. 
Um, I had no idea, but like the Sioux Indians, when they were fighting, um, you know, the, the frontiersmen, basically the white men that were invading their country uh, in the late 1800s, they, um, they had never seen the ocean. Like, for instance, Sitting Bull, who was a famous uh, Sioux chief who actually united a bunch of the Lakota and Cheyenne tribes to make up the Sioux Nation, uh, who ended up defeating Custer and, you know, the American military and making an embarrassment out of them. Um, but it was interesting that he had never seen the ocean, so he always grew up on the uh, American frontier uh, and never saw the ocean. But the and for the most part, no Sioux had ever seen the ocean. But you know, through generations of passed down information, they knew about the shark. And like, apparently, at some point, you know, obviously these people knew about shark attacks that happened on the on the coast with coastal Indians and things like that. And and then that ends up you know spreading all the way out west to a, a Sioux tribe that had never actually seen. Uh, you know, Indians, or not Indians, but never seen sharks or anything like that. And then um, to actually have, you know, that be a part of their culture is very interesting to me. But, you know, but my whole point is that culture is weird. Um, it's something that you just either, you don't have it when you didn't grow up and, and you're not experienced with that. So that's another thing. A large company, especially in IT, they try to save money. They ship jobs overseas. They uh, they bring in H-1Bs, you know, to, to take jobs uh, in America. A lot of that stuff is because companies are just gaming the system and they're trying to find um, talent that is going to be cheaper than, than typical talent that, that is uh, already in the country. And H-1B uh, visa, that's a whole other subject, but that's not very good for the, the person that actually comes here on an H-1B either because they're almost an indentured servant at that point. They have to deal with the company that they work for, and if that company gets rid of them for any reason or they decide to quit, they have to find another company that will end up jumping through the same hoops in order to you know, sponsor their H-1B program and things like that. So it doesn't really help either side. Um, and the whole thing was that it was supposed to bring in top talent, but for the most part, uh, companies are gaming the system. They're not bringing in top talent. They're just bringing in people that know, you know, the status quo with Java, C Sharp, and things like that, and um, you know, and and they do it to save a lot of money. So um, that part kind of sucks. Um, what else? So you know, large scale pro projects are going to be much much different than. Um, typical startup so a typical startup usually has like if you're a snapchat type or something like that you have like this one niche or niche uh, you know sometimes it's that's a funny word by the way because i've always said niche um uh, n-i-c-h-e um uh, but a lot of people say niche and like people that say niche they get like it rubs them the wrong way when you say niche and then when i say niche like niche rubs me the wrong way i'm like that's you know that's weird but anyway a lot of the startups they have this you know this this fine-tuned niche and that's what I'm gonna say because that's what I'm used to saying and it's very very focused on that so they're not doing a whole you know ton of stuff but then a larger company whether you're in like banking or you know some sort of finances or insurance or um, you know, even even gaming for the most part they, there's gonna there's, they're gonna be involved in a lot of different things like there's gonna be a lot of different departments so you're gonna be working on very very small bits of something that take up a very very large portion um, you know, the larger, bigger picture is harder to see, I would say, in some of those uh, larger corporations than they are with a startup. Like a startup, you're working 14, 16 hours a week. You know you're trying to grow. You know that you're trying to finish this UI or you know, hook up this database and you know, create this API. You pretty much know like the bigger picture, I think, in a, in a startup uh, much more easily than you would in a, in a larger corporation. Um, larger corporations also, <clears throat> there's a lot of political bullshit that you're going to deal with, too. You have a chain of command. You have, uh, you have obviously the executive vice presidents, and then you have assistant vice presidents and things like that. And then that's going to go down into like uh, the director levels and, and management, and then into leads, and then developers and senior developers. And um, it's just there. There's a whole big, humongous uh, hierarchy. And if you've ever seen Office Space, that is, there is a lot of accuracy to that whole TPS jobs report thing, where the guy had six different bosses. You have six, maybe fifteen, maybe even thirty-five different bosses in a large corporation, as opposed to much, you know, smaller startup. And in a way, the smaller startup is going to be pretty awesome too, because you can have a very, very good relationship with somebody that ends up controlling the destiny of the company much, much more than you know, like having a good relationship with a manager who then becomes a director who still has fifteen bosses above him or her. So there's a big, big difference, I think, between. Um, you know the, the the startup world and the large development, but you're gonna you're gonna obviously see that. 
Um, so that's a lot different than being a plumber or being an, an electrician or working on the job where you're working with five or six guys trying to do some HVAC work and you know, laying some duct work or something like that. Um, you know, being being in a corporation is much much uh, different. Like when it comes to a big open. Uh, oh yeah, it's bringing the open office space. So that's actually, you know, been plaguing companies all over the place. So they try to tear down the cubicle walls and everything's this big open spot. And you're expected to be able to code and collaborate and talk on the phone and have meetings and you know think clearly with all these visual and audible distractions that are around you. And that's actually another um, unfortunate thing to I think a larger type of setup. Now the smaller startup though that has an open office space, I would imagine that that would actually be much more suited um, you know, towards the open office space. And for that reason, it would probably be a much better experience. However, these startups are also plagued with younger developers, so there's probably going to be a lot of immaturity. Um, if you ever read that disrupted book, uh, you'll realize that um, you know he was telling a story about this one young guy that worked for HubSpot in Boston, Massachusetts. That ended up setting. He came in like still drunk from the night before one day and set like the um, the cleaning crew's cleaning cart on fire for some reason, like lit their trash can on fire. Um, but it can be like, and they're called programmers and, and, you know, some of the younger startups, you know, they're doing, uh, you know, a lot of different, they're doing a lot of different perks in order to keep people in the office longer. So they'll, they will be beer and alcohol involved. Uh, there may even be some, you know, some, uh, what, you know, I'm not going to use hand gestures, but you know what I'm talking about? Men, women, men, men, I don't, I don't know, but whatever people's preferences are, there's going to be some of that in the office space. You're not going to find that in a larger corporate environment. Um, now, people obviously do end up finding their spouses and significant others in their companies and stuff like that, and that's fine. Um, but you can't have a you can't have your boss be your your wife or whatever. Most major companies have policies in place for something like that. I guess I'm going off on all kinds of side tangents and probably moving away from uh, what you're talking about with uh, you know specifically with programming stuff. But either way, uh, this this seems interesting enough. Uh, so what else? Um, I could actually make several videos on this. I really could because uh, I feel like there's a lot more to talk about. Larger companies, in my opinion, also like they'll have uh, on-site conveniences. So there's going to be weight rooms, and there's going to be um, sometimes like I've even heard of like like uh, aquatic aquatics and stuff like that. Uh, but like you know, basketball, horseshoes, grilling out. Uh, a lot of that stuff will be available on a larger um, programming company. They'll have foosball and all that stuff there. Um, some of the younger, smaller startups are not going to have that same stuff. But then you guys might be like leaving the office a lot more, which I wish we did a lot more um, in large corporate worlds. I wish we could get outside. In fact, if I had my way and I led a team of like 10 or 11 people, I would have our daily scrum take a you know a walk even if it's a walk around the building or a walk around the outside of the campus like i feel like you know let's talk about what are we working on guys oh yeah like, like let's get face to face if we can now obviously that's not the case with um, a lot of this remoting stuff but um you know basically let's try to get outside in nature a little bit more we don't have to be cooped up in offices all the time and um and it, for me like if i ever ran my own company i would be pushing that a lot uh, so that brings up the whole in a large company, uh, maybe even a small one too. In fact, I, I talked to uh, a smaller startup that was doing um, cybersecurity, and they worked for a, they got bought by a much larger defense contractor. But this company, half of their their developers were in Orlando, Florida, and the other half were in Northern Virginia. And they would use things like Slack and um, and um, like Google Hangouts and stuff like that in order to have face to face meetings. And and that's a big part of your day because. A lot of the times you're, you're communicating with people um, that are all over the country. In fact, I, I mean, I've, I've witnessed that firsthand where we'll have people in Buffalo and, um, you know, and, and, and New York and Washington, D.C. and Georgia. Like, I mean, and we're all like in the same meetings. And um, that's something that that is um, it, it's cool. But it also uh, there, there's some challenging things there, too. So when you're trying to be this open, collaborative thing and half your team is on the other side of the country, it's not. Uh, it kind of defeats the purpose of the open office space in that in that regard. Um, so that's really uh, that's probably where I'm going to end this. I try to keep my videos at like 15 minutes. Uh, make sure you guys check out my sponsor, Dev Mountain Coding Bootcamp. So thanks to them, I'm able to make these videos, and um, you know I want want to stress to the fact that, that they do help me out, and that um, you guys will be doing me a great service if you also check them out. And 
That's about it. So this is a great subject, though, because honestly, I didn't even think that I had this much to say until I started saying it. And I really feel like there is so much more that I could talk about. So I plan on doing that some more in the future then, um, just because I, I like to reflect on it, too. So anyway, guys, uh, thanks for watching and take care. Please subscribe. Bye. Hey, guys. So a lot of you ask me, how do I get my foot in the door to become a programmer? And I just want to take a moment to mention Dev Mountain Coding Bootcamp is a 12-week intensive course that focuses on the technologies of the here and now for web development. Uh, some of the things that they're actually teaching in this 12-week course, it's geared to get you into the, the industry by focusing on things like jQuery, Node.js, React, Angular, how to use GitHub. So a lot of the things that you're going to need to do as a developer, as soon as you start, they're going to be teaching you in this in this coding boot camp. And the entire goal is to be able to get you into the industry within 12 weeks. So if you guys are interested in learning more information about Dev Mountain Coding Boot Camp, just check out the link in the description tab of this video. Thank you for watching and have a good day.